Well, good afternoon. I very much would like to welcome you to our panel on anti-coercion, panel 21. I welcome you in the room. I welcome also uh, colleagues uh, online. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, the members of the panel. Um, Tian Chen Ni. She is a WTO Chung Yuan Institution for Economic Research uh, Assistant Research Fellow in Taiwan. Then Professor Lidiana Bukovic yes. is a professor at the uh, University of British Columbia. Professor Yuka Fukuaga from uh, Waseda University in Japan. And Dr. Lothar Ehring, senior expert of DG Trade uh, in uh, Brussels here. Uh, throughout history, um, states have always used uh, trade measures for political ends um, to address essentially uh, a political problem rather than a commercial or trade problem, but using uh, trade tools uh, to this uh, effect here. And uh, I just recall again the book by Andreas Löwenfeld, uh, which was published in 1983, depicting the long history of these kind of measures. But I think in, in recent years, we have uh, seen an enhanced recourse uh, to uh, such measures for political ends. And um, countries started to reflect how to react uh, to these kind of measures. And uh, currently we have uh, legislation in the EU being uh, developed. And I'm very glad that Lothar, who is one of the architects of this, uh, these measures is, is with us and as well and in the United States. But the, of course, the debate goes uh, much broader than uh, simply uh, the response, but actually to what extent these measures taken for political ends are uh, in line with international law. We have two papers which are presented in this session. And we start off with these two papers. Each of the presenter has seven minutes and then we have two comments on the papers. So that gets us uh, done within half an hour for uh, the paper presentation. And then we move into uh, the discussion. And um, the first question we would then want to discuss, and I would really like to include you in the room on all, all these sessions, on, on these uh, issues directly, it's then um, to what extent are these measures compatible with public international law. The question about the use of force and the threat of use of force, to what extent that, can that still be distinguished uh, from economic measures as we traditionally do? And then um, to what extent are these measures compatible with, with WTO law? On the one hand, uh, the, uh, the measures imposed, but on the other hand, also the countermeasures. And the question I'm personally then most interested in is, uh, can we develop collective action reactions to these kind of things, or do we have to leave it just with the unilateral approach uh, we we normally apply uh, today in uh, in the multilateral system here? So um, we would we would start off with uh, the paper from uh, Tin Chen Yi. It's a more general paper, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so thank you all the professors. I'm, uh, I'm Ting Chen Ye. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very grateful to be uh, part, of the, this, part of this panel with all the distinguished professors here. Uh, I'm a PhD student from NYCU uh, based in Taiwan, but I'm also working as a research associate at Taiwan WN RT Center at SEER. And so because of my background, I would like to share some trace data related to the related to the case I'm going to introduce you later. So I think uh, before we talk about anti-coercion, we should first understand. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I better stand here. Um, I think before we talk about anti-coercion, we should first understand uh, what is economic coercion. And I believe that addressing this problem is more necessary than now 
than, than before because of its impact on multilateral trading system. And I would like to give you an example in Taiwan, recently it's facing to uh, explain what is happening now. So most of the time, China exerts economic, economic pressure by refusing to import agricultural products by, uh, under the disguise of SPS measures, right? So if anyone still recalls last year when uh, Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in August, uh, before and after actually China has uh, suspended the importation of more than thousand of agricultural products into uh, Taiwan, citing the reasons such as uh, excessive pesticide residues in citrus, citrus fruits and uh, detection of COVID-19 on the packaging of seafood. So, but this year China has actually created a new form of, of economic coercion that is called uh, the this trade barrier investigation. So on April 12, China announced this investigation against Taiwan because Taiwan has adopted restrictive measures targeting more than 2,400 items uh, from China, which covers agriculture, uh, textiles, and mineral sectors. And so although the, this invest investigation is supposed to be end in October, this year, October 12, the China government also stated that under special circumstances, this investigation could be extended to the next year, January 12. So in fact, um, for the last two to three decades, um, due to some historical reasons, Taiwan has actually restricted 2,455 items imports from China. And this trade dynamic has made Taiwan actually enjoy a trade surplus of around 156.5 billion US dollars. So people would be guessing if China wants full markets access from Taiwan. Um, however, when we look at uh, this graph, the restricted uh, list of item products has only very slight trade value between the two countries. And only over the past five years, actually uh, the MW0 products only made up around three to 4% of Taiwan's total exports to China which amounts to approximately 4 billion US dollars. So in terms of the overall economic impact, actually the, the impact is not really significant. So um, then why China still wants to do this, adopting these measures against Taiwan? Um, I think the sure thing is that China does not want full market access because our market is too small. Uh, but we can see that although China has threatened us to impose economic cost on Taiwan with two actions. First is this trade barrier investigation and followed by uh, take a, taking a punitive tariff symmetrically regarding the same list of the items. However, the actual economic costs are not what China is seeking. Rather, uh, this economic pressure stem from underlying political uh, intentions, especially when we know that the date of uh, January 13, 2024 is actually the date of Taiwan's presidential elections. So by extending three months investigation period to January 12 next year, um, China thinks it can make influence on uh, our elections. And most of and it's, this is one of the common tactics of economic coercion actually. So by this investigation, um, it can create a societal atmosphere telling Taiwanese people that to face the reality that China used to give us a favorable treatment in the past. So we can't get it for free anymore unless we are willing to talk about the issue of cross-trade uh, unification. So on the other hand, China also wants to showcase domestically that it has the upper hand in building the cross-strait relationship. <coughs> so in my paper, um, I've also investigated some possible counter strategies uh, against economic coercion. And these strategies can actually be broadly summarized into two aspects. Uh, one is direct response. That is, uh, that, that could involve measures such as mirroring the coercive actions or just do public announcements in the diplomatic occasions. And uh, the other kind of counter strategies is indirect response. Uh, so this might focus on enhancing the supply, uh, building a resilient supply chain or receiving economic assistance from other third countries. So the key point of this kind of indirect response is to mitigate the negative impact from uh, the coercion without provoking a coercive state.
um, in the fact, so in the final part of my paper, I actually chose uh, anti-coercion law as case study among all the available anti-coercion tools. Uh, while both the EU and the US have uh, introduced their own version of anti-coercion laws, I think uh, the proposed responses are somewhat different. And this difference also indicates varying levels of the consistency with the WTO. So uh, time is limited. I'll just uh, quickly sum up the results of my research so far. Um, first is that economic coercion has become a favorable tool uh, because it can easily bypass military conflicts and targeting vulnerable industries in small countries. And I think the introduction of anti-coercion laws is uh, understandable because in economic coercion are uh, often adopted through informal channels and it is hard to define the exact form and the exact scale so it could be a very a big challenge for the affected state to identify the specific measure and to resort to the WTO. So the third is that anti-coercion law is rapid and efficient. I, re I recognize that, but uh, it's, its legality remains unsettled and the ambiguity might arise when uh, it is adopted without legitimate justification. So I, I think that uh, maybe prior consultation with the coerced state or uh, the provision of economic relief to the course to uh, to the core state um, can reduce further retaliation and escalation of trade confrontation. Thank you. Thank you very much for being wonderfully in time, and I'm pleased to give you the floor for Thank the case you. study on uh, uh, Lithuania. Okay, I don't have any slides. Um, I'll try to be uh, really short and precise. So in my paper, I actually looked into this uh, case um, dispute between Lithuania and uh, China that later spilled over um, into being a dispute between EU and, and um, China and WTO. And I looked into the EU response to Chinese restrictive measures imposed on Lithuania in the context of the EU attempt to develop a long-term strategy to deal with China and to enhance its open strategy autonomy, meaning to remain op open for trade and investment while building resilience and self-reliance and being able to respond in much more assertive way um, to unfair behavior of states, because that's what really economic coercion is. It is unfair behavior. Um, and um, really what the EU um, seem to be trying uh, to do is to survive the new geopolitical reality. And that reality is that uh, from June, 2022, uh, the EU has become the largest target of China's coercive measures. And um, in short, Lithuania got targeted by China's restrictive measures because in 2021, it allowed opening a non-diplomatic office of Taiwan in Wilnius, but under the name Taiwan, not Chinese Taipei. Um, so these economic coercion measures were utilized to basically force Lithuania to change its foreign policy course which has been pro-Taiwan oriented um, since Lithuania supported, for example, Taiwan's participating in the work of WHO. It also was very critical of uh, China's human rights regime and treatment of ethnic minorities. Um, so interestingly, um, the EU started turning uh, its attention to the impact of China on the functioning of the internal market and its member states, sometimes around um, 2019, when the joint uh, communication entitled The Strategic Outlook on um, EU-China Relation was published. And I emphasize that because that, to me, is the beginning of thinking about this as a long haul um, strategy um, and comprehensive strategy, because it has to address three dimensions of the relationship between EU and China. And that is partnership, competition, and systemic rivalry. So um, this case is illustrative um, in the, for a number of reasons. First, it's a standard circumstance in which economic coercion tries, asymmetric interdependence and trade imbalance. I mean, uh, Lithuania is really um, not a big trading partner for China. Um, it's only 1% of Lithuanians trade that even goes to China. It has trade deficits with China, but who doesn't? Um, and, um, you know, even though it has bilateral investment treaty with China, even though it was uh, the part of 16 plus one forum, it never received major 
investments from China. It, it's something like 40th uh, foreign investor in uh, Lithuania. So really not a big deal in terms of you know, their uh, trade. But this is still the first case that China imposed such harsh primary coercive measure on um, an EU member. So very disproportionate considering the amount of trade and uh, very harsh because simply, you know, one day um, uh, nobody could actually register through the customs administrative website um, and uh, it was total embargo. And Chinese responded that it was just a glitch. Well, um, after a week, the glitch was so to some extent resolved, but still there were restrictions following all the time. So anyways, it is also the first case that China threatened to impose secondary coercive measures against other member states companies that use Lithuanian parts for goods that they export to China. And this is the first case that the EU brought to the WTO in relation to alleged economic coercion against one of the member states. Of course, China previously threatened and imposed some restrictions on other countries like Sweden and Czech Republic, but EU never got involved at that level. And what's also interesting is that both Lithuania and EU tried first bilaterally to resolve this uh, through consultations with China. It didn't work. So eventually um, it opened up you know, the space for a dispute to go to the WTO, which European Union did, uh, requesting first uh, in January 2022 consultations. Then in December 2022, um, requested the establishment of panel which actually happened in uh, late January, 2023. And the panel was composed in April, uh, 2023, uh, but we don't have the report on it. Now, interestingly, the dispute was unfolding when the EU um, actually um, still had the uh, anti-corrosion instrument regulation in the pipeline. And um, in my view, even if the legislation um, was in force at the time when this dispute has you know, um, started, I think that the EU would have chosen the same path, at least what it says in the proposal uh, for the legislation that it will go to the WTO rather than you know, trying to um, use the avenue that the AC is proposing. And that is that um, you know, to challenge the case um, as being uh, really um, the um, uh, violation of the uh, non, um, non-interference principle and uh, customary international law and uh, it wouldn't really impose a sanction. So if I am uh, on time, I just want to say one more thing. Do I sure. Have? Okay. Yeah, another minute. What's really interesting is that after Chinese embargo, a number of Lithuanian companies lobbied the government to change, um, you know, its head and to ask Taiwan to change the name of the office and also German companies operating in Lithuania and also, you know, having uh, interest in, uh, in uh, China lobbied the government to do the same. And I think there was a moment of regret even for the Lithuanian president because in one point he said, well, maybe that was a mistake to, uh, you know, allow this office to happen. And Lithuania um, really suffered and struggled to recover the losses. And I have to say that, you know, they first apply um, to uh, the European uh, Commission and they sought to approval of the scheme uh, to provide uh, 130 million euros in the form of loans to Lithuanian companies affected by these restrictive measures. And they also asked to reallocate the part of its 2.2 billion uh, COVID-19 recovery grant uh, from the uh, Commission. I don't know how that goes, maybe you can fill in whether they got any money on that. But 130 companies really couldn't uh, export at all to uh, China. And it wasn't really easy for all of them to uh, quickly turn around and find new markets. So th that's the real impact on small economies, right? So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we had a, a wonderful uh, insight into uh, the situation in Taiwan and uh, with Lithuania and the EU. I think there were also other countries targeted, particularly Australia, went yeah. through a cycle. Uh, are you aware of any other countries? Canada, Canada as well. Okay, yeah. so it's it's a pattern here we, we see. Yeah. Um, I would propose now that um, 
Yuka, could you comment sure. five minutes on the paper? Maybe also raise questions you have. Yes. And then uh, Lothar would do the same for, mm -hmm. for your paper. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Ms. May, for your uh, very interesting intervention. And I also read your excellent uh, paper. Um, it's, uh, it's an excellent interdisciplinary study of anti-coercion instruments. And um, it, I think you're quite right that we have to analyze this issue from a, not just from a legal perspective, but, but from also political perspective. But since I am a international professor, let me make some comments on from a international law perspective. And I think I'm gonna make three comments, but many of my comments are related to what Professor Cotier raised for quest for discussion. So maybe I'll just give an outline of my observations and leave more deeper discussions later. So my first uh, comment is about the definition of economic coercion. And in your paper, you defined, I mean, you, you, you um, uh, raised uh, several uh, definitions of economic coercion, but one of the definitions you gave is that it's a situation where one country threatens or imposes uh, economic costs on another country to influence or change its foreign policy. And I think that probably in almost every definition of economic coercion, there's an element of intent or objective. There is an intent of coercing country to change the foreign policy of another state. And my question is, and, and that intent, the element of intent involves subjectivity or maybe arbitrariness. So my question would be how to define or how to determine the existence of this intent and how to make sure that um, the determination is not arbitrary. And also maybe I have a question about, about the necessity of uh, defining an action as coercive action. For example, I, maybe it's just the lack of my understanding, but you raised an issue of uh, trade barriers investigation uh, against Taiwan. And this trade barrier investigation may be in itself a violation of WTO law, even without, it, 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 it may, may be a coercion or it may not be a coercion, but anyway, it has a trade restrictive impact. And for that reason, it may be a vi violation of WTO law. So I'm wondering why do we have to define something as a coercive action? So my first observation is about the definition of uh, economic coercion. And the second question is really a, like a big picture uh, question that I don't have an answer to. Um, it's about uh, the relationship between the WTO law and international law, or, or to be more precise, it's about um, where WTO law is situated in the real realm of international law. And in your paper, you said that, or maybe the, this may be in the EU position, if something falls outside WTO, um, it's a matter of customary international law and WTO law may not apply. But to me, I think um, customary international law and WTO law can apply to the same issue. So one thing might be what, for example, an anti-coercive instrument may be justified as countermeasure under public international, international law. But that does not mean that the measure, counter, countermeasure, may be in violation of WTO law. So how do we sort of reconcile these different uh, areas of international law? So that's my second very big question. The third is really general uh, observation. It, uh, and I totally agree with you about the implications for the multilateral trading system. And to me, an um, anti coercive instrument is like a painkiller. It's very, as you said, it's a rapid and effective solution. It may not be a solution, but it's a, it's a remedy to, uh, it's a, it's a rapid, rapid remedy to a situation, but it has side effects. So maybe we have to think about longer, longer term, uh, softer, uh, like a yoga type 
solution to the situation. So that's my observation. Thank you very much. Uh, you raised uh, very, very interesting questions also about the relationship between uh, general public international law and WTO law. Um, I don't know, you will take up these questions right away, but is there anything you would just like to quickly reply to the comment? You don't have to, but in case I, I, you wish. I want to leave my answers later. Okay, you'll do that later. So can I give you the floor, Volkar, for commenting uh, Juliana's paper? Yes, you, you can. Thank you. You don't have to, because I don't really have anything uh, to comment. There's nothing much on what was said. Um, but I will nevertheless try to uh, say, contribute something useful. I also have five sure. minutes. Yeah. Um, coercion. So first of all, um, what is coercion? Coercion itself is, of course, broader potentially than economic measures. Um, a recent example is uh, before the February invasion, <coughs> there was a military buildup um, outside of Ukraine on the Russian side of the border, uh, and Ukraine was being coerced by um, Russia. Yeah, the demand was regime change, denazification, um, and and more. Yeah, those those were demands. That was an attempt. Uh, supported by the threat of the use of force, yeah. military uh, buildup. So it was a breach, of course, of already on the ban of the ban on the use of force or threat of the use of force. But it was also coercion because, you know, internal regime that uh, was, of course, an internal Ukrainian affair and uh, the Russian government tried to uh, interfere with it. So it satisfies the conditions of the international, general international law breach of intervention or interference in internal affairs of another state. Um, but it was military coercion. It was not economic coercion. I gloss over now that there were also economic me measures in play. But that coercion was not economic coercion. And today, the international debate about coercion is about economic coercion. And those measures, whereas what I just mentioned, that belongs in the United Nations. Uh, there are rules on this. They are, they are, they are pretty uh, clear. Um, and the coercion aspect is not important. Why? Because we have the prohibition, use Kogans uh, on the use of force and the threat of the use of force. Now, the only thing that is debatable is whether that prohibition exists for 100 years or only for 75 uh, years, but it is completely um, established and uncontroversial. So we are speaking here usefully about below the threshold. Um, of force or threat of uh, force. That is then also an area relevant to the WTO because the other one isn't. Um, and so the first thing I'll, I'll say is uh, coercion as a breach of general international law. It is again the same norm, so I will not repeat it. The prohibition on intervention, interference in the internal or external affairs of another state, uh, that is prohibited, has always been prohibited well before the use of force was prohibited in international law. And so the only question is, what means of intervention, interference, coercion, the ICJ in the Nicaragua case said, use this concept of coercion, and then said, one obvious form of coercion is the use of force. But that brings us back to this other area and that's not useful for us. So, and below the threshold of use or threat of force, we are indeed already in the controversial zone and in general international law. The ICJ in the Nicaragua case said nothing useful on this. Yeah. I know it dealt with the um, trade embargo. It's a very long decision with many claims, and this one did not receive uh, attention. Nevertheless, the Nicaragua judgment is all the time used and quoted, and of course one has to deal with it. But this is one ruling yeah, <laughs> in 100 years. Uh, this is just like there were one panel ruling uh, in the WTO or panel plus appellate body, if you really want. Um, that does not close the matter. That does not exhaust the law um, on this issue. I, I'm telling you, uh, although there are people who say the opposite, there are people who say there is no ban on or no ban on intervention interference if it is not through military means. Um, but I say that prohibition does exist. It covers more than just the use of force. And um, Economic measures, restrictions, if they have a sufficient intensity, 
indeed can follow that. So then we have a breach of general international law, which you know means customary law. This is not codified anywhere. We have the friendly uh, relations declaration of the United Nations with other declarations which were adopted by majority uh, and uh, abstentions or, or counter votes. They are not considered uh, customary as the friendly relations declaration is, but all this does not really uh, tell you uh, anything more than what is anyway um, established. But so we have this breach, it's a bit controversial, but uh, we think we are on the right side of this uh, debate. Can these measures also breach a trade agreement, WTO, FTA, FCN agreements? Yes, of course. I will not get into detail, SPS, I'm dumping, Article 11 gaps. Um, and what does that mean? <laughs> does that mean that Article 23 of the DSU applies, but it is not allowed to do anything else about this than starting a WTO dispute? That's what many people think, um, but that is wrong um, for a very simple reason, because 23 applies to the enforcement of WTO rights when a member is seeking the redress of a violation yes, uh, of the WTO agreement, not when a member seeks the redress of the violation of the general uh, principle of sovereign equality, part of which is the non-intervention principle. So that's not covered by Article 23, and hence, um, the exclusivity of the dispute settlement system of the WTO does not apply. People have other views and say, no, 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 when it is also WTO, then that takes priority. I tell those people, take something much simpler with that you're all familiar with, that is the parallel breach of the WTO agreement and an FTA. Every FTA has a national treatment obligation. So if the national treatment obligation of the free trade agreement is being enforced in the bilateral dispute settlement system, is that a breach of Article 23 of the GS2? Nobody has ever argued this. I would recommend that one to uh, scholars because that's much more interesting given that it is impossible to seek the redress of a national treatment violation on an FDA without simultaneously seeking the redress of the WTO national treatment obligation because it's the same obligation. It's usually even worded the same way or a reference to Article 3 of the GATT. Um, the non interference um, enforcement and the national uh, treatment or Article 11 uh, enforcement. Those are different obligations. They just happen to exist uh, simultaneously. So we have no problem with the WTO, uh, but here comes immediately the next problem. And that is when we speak of reactions. If they take the form of a countermeasure, and this countermeasure takes the form also of a departure from the WTO agreement, then we get into this known territory of can you invoke the countermeasure as a justification for the departure of your WTO obligations? And um, I'm telling you, yes, because that is a standard, also customary international right to enforce your rights, not WTO rights, are in 23 DSU, but you can't do through a countermeasure, only via the DSU. But non WTO law, nothing in the WTO agreement, nothing in any other agreement, by the way ever says that it is not allowed to depart from the obligations under that treaty for the purpose of enforcing international rights by way of uh, countermeasure. But this is something that the WTO as a system, the membership, uh, the adjudicators still have to warm up to um, because this has so far not been established. Um, many uh, disputed this uh, so far. Uh, but maybe later I can give you other examples uh, to show why this is the inevitable um, conclusion. Final remark, um, of course, I know that the WTO has an exclusively applicable special regime of enforcement and therefore the standard rules on state responsibility don't apply. But that again applies only to the enforcement of WTO rights. The WTO has its own special regime for the enforcement of WTO rights. That's the whole DSU. And that, of course, does not apply um, to what you do by countermeasure, which serves the purpose of enforcing a non WTO international right. That's why there is no problem. Okay. So, should we stop here? I don't know. Uh, well, you, you anticipated some of the issues uh, we want to take up now systematically, but would you like to respond <coughs> briefly? And uh, particularly what I would like to invite you to um, uh, be a bit more specific in defining the countermeasures which are contemplated by the EU 
and also by the United States so that we know what we're talking about. Um, so, yeah, I, I just like to add something to um, what was said, because, um, you know, I think that uh, this is the, this interpretation of the, you know, kind of a interaction between the um, EU law and EU regulation uh, with public international law and with the um, with the WTO is something that uh, commission has elaborated really in all um, of its, uh, you know, assessments. Uh, reports and also in the proposal as well. But um, I think that, um, yeah, there will be scholars who would argue that um, this is really a tricky area and that perhaps, uh, you know, it is that the countermeasures um, that the EU would apply. Um, and the EU, I just want to be sure that you know, we all understand the EU doesn't really say that it would automatically apply the countermeasure when they make an assessment that the behavior of another country um, or third country, as they say, would qualify as economic coercion. On the contrary, it is really the last resort. I mean, all through the regulation, you have the process of non-intervention first, where the EU would try to really engage with uh, that country, with other country, with international organizations, and try to really um, kind of a, avoid eye for an eye kind of a, uh, you know, uh, interaction, yeah. retaliation. That's, that's what the countermeasures really end up being, right? Um, so, so that's the first thing. Um, and then, you know, the second thing is that um, there is this idea that those countermeasures should actually not be arbitrary, but really proportionate to uh, the harm um, and to the intensity of those measures that, um, you know, coercing measures that have actually triggered the reaction of, um, of the European Union. But um, I also want to just say one thing that, you know, there are, I came across writings where um, you know the um, scholars of you know public international law and the WTO would say would indicate that potentially even you know in the text of this regulation you see that the Commission is open to the idea that others would challenge uh, the countermeasures before the WTO and it says actually in I think Article 10 that. Yeah, if there is a challenge in the WTO, and if there is a, of course, you know, adjudication that they would terminate the measure. Uh, so there is this recognition that maybe this is a gray area, that it's not so clear cut. And, and even if it isn't, it doesn't really stop, uh, you know, uh, the third country to challenge it before WTO. Now, what I wanna ask, would it be possible to maybe imagine that, um, the EU can then use um, kind of a justification uh, for the measure, again, dig into the WTO rules and to say, oh, maybe it, there is a national security exception that we can invoke here. I uh, or yeah. I know I, uh, somebody says even maybe public morale, but I think that that's stretch. Yeah. Uh, I would rather say maybe yeah. you know national security. And that would depend how you really define what a you know that really okay. is and before just... we go into this i just really like to clarify about the remedies okay. um i read that in the united states it's contemplated that companies may be compensated for losses is that is that also the case uh, in the in the eu that the company of the affected could actually get compensation the lithuanian companies and those who lost uh, these measures they would be able to claim compensation no no we're just looking is not, but in the US they could. That's the difference, is it? What is That's being bill, discussed? Huh? In the US, the bill, the yes. Okay. I, I forgot the statistics, but when I was in the United States, I learned that the percentage of bills that don't become laws. I don't know. Okay, so it's not or... yet. It's not yet. Secure. Okay. So I think we we uh, we had a very good start. I'd like to ask uh, whether there's any questions relating to the notion and the measures and what we've discussed so far. We go now more systematically into compatibility with international law and WTO law. Any questions or comments from your side? 
the ones that can also briefly react, uh, or maybe also the others want to uh, react to what, what they heard. Um, we take it step by step. That's my plan. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I, I have just a question for Tim Chen. Uh, I think you need to speak into the uh, the mic here. Can you pass it then? Okay. Kai Carmody, University of Western Ontario. So uh, Ting Chen, uh, I just was curious as to um, in this uh, situation that Taiwan is facing, whether it has contemplated um, uh, the possibility of a, a panel uh, at the WTO, given that both Taiwan and China are <coughs> WTO members um, and possibly uh, you know, seeking some sort of recourse, either violation or non-violation. Um, if only uh, to, well, you know, paper the file as it were, um, so that there's a, a record of this that's made. And even if Taiwan can't do very much, um, that uh, Taiwan at least has every um, ability to sort of, you know, pull back the covers on this dirty practice and, uh, and seek some sort of recourse that way. Thank you, Charlotte Sieber from the Geneva Graduate Institute. I have a more basic question regarding definition of economic coercion and whether it falls or falls not within the entirely within the WTO framework. What I have troubles with is um, the fact that the GATT was in, in part built to prevent trade wars. And if we continue to think along the line of coercion and anti-coercion, it seems to me that it inve inevitably actually leads to a trade war. So I would like to, to hear your points of view, how you, you deal with the, the problem of potential escalation. Okay, we, we take two more questions and we continue. Um, hello, I have a question to the first speaker. Um, I'm curious if you have looked at the Chinese attempts to introduce similar anti-coercion instruments. In particular, I refer to anti-foreign sanctions law, which China in particular described as a sell instrument to self-protect itself from economic sanctions imposed against China, including against some entities like Huawei, for example. And then I have another question for Lothar. Um, So from your presentation, I got that uh, in your view, and it's probably the most widespread view in the literature, economic coercion, not always illegal. It's illegal only when it constitutes intervention. And then the question is threshold. So this is the most kind of debated question in literature, if one would say so. And with reference to the case study, uh, when Lithuania was sanctioned, in fact, Lithuania didn't have that much trade with China. So should we look all the, at the trade flow when, the, when we defined economic coercion, or should we just look at the objectives pursued by this measure. Thanks. Uh, to a, a brief comment and a brief a question uh, to Yuka, in, indeed, I think it is a very fundamental question with regard to how do we detect inten intention? And I think that generally in the, the WTO, we have some a reluctance to deal with subjective issues. I guess that you know that with regard to national treatment, there are some inconsistent decisions. But I must say that in other branches of international law, other tribunals are not afraid at all. That's international criminal law in, intention is very important, or the ICJ, or law of the sea. I, I mean, in many cases, you have good uh, evidence about the, the intention. And actually here, I just saw that the government of China clearly said what it is the intention. I mean, in many cases, states, state, they do say we intend to get something. But yeah, but it's really a fundamental question. And to Liliana, what is the main uh, difference or argument of China? Is it, in that, is it indeed Article 21, security, something like that? Thank you. I'll take this back. Okay. So who would like to respond? Can I just briefly, because it's yeah, really please. short. So, you know, I haven't really seen anything official from China because they're basically denying that this is what, what they're doing. They're fantastic in actually using this. I mean, you have different types of 
economic coercion. You have explicit economic coercion, you have disguised economic coercion, and you have the silent. So theirs is really disguised. It's always about something else happening. Oh, you know, Canadian canola is not of a good quality. So therefore we will suspend it. And, you know, suspension or, you know, the measures, restrictive measures would come like three days after Canada detained Huawei executor and stuff like that, right? So, so they never say this is, why we are doing it. Of course, it's really easy to establish the intent when they say, oh yeah, that we actually want you to change your policy and this is what we want you to do. They actually don't say that. And that's the tricky part of it. And that's the tricky part of the question that Yuka has asked, because really, if you are talking about traditional coercion, you really don't talk about that intention. It is that intensity that really justifies your um, responsive measure. And if you look into the definition of, of economic coercion that is given um, by the regulation, which I think it's quite a brave act because there is no any definition, uh, clear definition in international law, what it is. And it's difficult in domestic law to define it. Let's face it. Whoever teaches contracts or thoughts knows that. Um, so, so the question then is that European Union in this document, in this regulation has really put the objective measures as to how they are going to assess it. So that it has to be a high threshold, that it has to be the high intensity. If it is a complete embargo, then it's pretty clear that that is the threshold. But it never actually developed um, any specific reference to that intention. It just says in one particular article, oh, this is the particular measure that, <laughs> you know, is aimed at interfering with, you know, other policies. And that's that subjective element. So it, it becomes dubious. But again, if you really read the commission um, assessment, what the commission is saying, this is the last resort. This is really just for those very specific cases that do not come within the WTO umbrella, but do require our reaction. So it would be really those, I mean, how do you go about these uh, popular boycotts that are all actually, you know, organized through China, CCP and the government organizations. And that really happened. Like Lithuanian companies were facing that. Suddenly contracts were not renewed. Suddenly, there was no raw material that needed to be, you know, um, given to the to the Lithuanian companies. Suddenly, Lithuanian goods disappeared from the shelves. Right. So that's that kind of an implied coercion that's very difficult to actually show an invention. Right. Mm -hmm. So we would like to. Yes, love. I can just. Uh follow on this and, and say that in a case like this, of course, the question is that of the government's involvement. Yeah? Yeah. And we can also have questions of attribution uh, yeah. for international lawyers is a standard. Uh, on intention, can I uh, use maybe the um, uh, categories and words which Marco Milanovic, a very pedagogically brilliant uh, lecturer in Professor Mono Redding, uh, has used in his inaugural lecture on the subject of uh, and its international legality, which is demand, threat, harm. That's the architecture of uh, coercion. And indeed, the demand involves the intention. Um, but here, there's some bad news that indeed certain governments do things in a veiled manner and don't publicize very clearly, black on white. You know, we had a, a government in the West, uh, United States, uh, Donald Trump, where this was far more transparent uh, on, on Twitter, um, easy to use as evidence of what is the demand, uh, also what is the threat. Um, so in this other model, the threat, the harm is there, but the demand is not so officially expressed. But here's the good news, and, and that's where you need then evidence, and that evidence can be circumstantial and indirect, it can be intelligent. But the good news is coercion only works if the other side understands what the demand is. Because if as a country you face a trade restriction, but you don't know what the other country wants from you in order to lift that trade restriction again, or doesn't want anything from you, yeah, then it's just a protectionist measure or just a double breach. 
And then, of course, we are squarely just in the realm of the WTO. Um, so if, if it is coercive, then you will know it because you know there's a connection and it's a punishment for something that you have done or a, a disincentive for doing it again or, or for, for, for others. And so, um, and, and then on, on, on threshold, uh, again, uh, Marco Milanovic, the zone that is a bit controversial indeed, but some of you will say embargo, well, of course it doesn't have to reach the threshold of an embargo. So the, the zone is that between talk and force. Yeah, force, we spoke about it, we'll get into that again. And talk is of course not coercion. If you make declarations as a government and you say, we really want, you know, that other government to do this and that for us. So that would be nice. That is, of course, not coercion. Yeah, but we're speaking here about economic restrictions, trade restrictions that have severe impact. Yeah, even if it's 1% of trade, don't forget the inputs and that this harmed uh, Lithuanian interests in trade in all other directions. Um, that can uh, easily be, um, you know. Now, the, the proposal, uh, it is true that the, not the proposal itself, but the accompanying impact assessment report contains some language to address this question of the international law uh, and so on. But this is not, don't understand this as an elaborate and exhaustive uh, rationale, reasoning, and explanation. Um, we have a consistent policy that we don't publish. Um, internal legal analysis that show whether a proposal or adopted legislation is WTO uh, compatible. Yeah, you understand why we don't do that. Nobody else does this, uh, by the way. So uh, this is just a small uh, bits that we put there in order to not have uh, not, nothing there. Countermeasure is indeed intended as a last resort, but it has to be a last resort also under general international law. You cannot just react to a breach by slapping a countermeasure. You have to call on the other country to cease the breach. You have to offer negotiations. Um, you don't have to offer adjudication. No? Uh, Ranjo Ruiz uh, in the um, ILC uh, pushed for that uh, 30 years ago and um, did not uh, prevail. Um, but it is good. Adjudication is good. That's why we have 23 years uh, It would be ideal if that was a generally applicable rule that is not there and as you know for going to a tribunal you need consent so you need an international agreement to do that that is possible that is envisaged in our regulation but it will depend on the agreement of the other side countermeasures have to be proportionate and for that reason alone of course they can be challenged in court yeah? and that can be again an agreed uh, compromise uh, that will have to be as well in WTO if this is about the coercion itself and then the legitimacy of the countermeasure. But indeed, because we have compulsory jurisdiction in the WTO, the countermeasure uh, takes the form of a WTO departure rather than a departure from another international agreement. Um, bilateral, for example, the UG elimination of an FTA, uh, then the EU cannot escape that um, litigation. Uh, that's why I mentioned all these things, the invocation of the right to a countermeasure before a WTO panel. Um, but irrespective of that, that challenge is of course legitimate because just imagine the countermeasure were disproportionate. On the general international law, countermeasures have to be proportionate. And if it is not, it's not permitted to that extent. Yeah, And to that extent, the other country should then uh, certainly uh, win. Um, but if the victory is based on the mistaken application of international law, which quite a few people, one of them is sitting in front of me, have argued in the past that the WTO panel is on an obligation because of the DSU, although the DSU doesn't say that, to ignore the non-WTO uh, justification for, for the measure, then of course that WTO ruling would not reflect international law. And that would be a, a problem that would have to be handled Different. There was a question also about Article 21. Um, so in all standard cases, uh, the EU in such a case would not involve and not be able to involve Article 21 to justify the contribution. Why? Because the situation uh, is not bad enough to amount to an emergency in international action. It's as simple as that. Um, that does not exclude that a situation of coercion 
can amount to an emergency of international relations. Yeah? If it's a threat of use of force or, or it gets us back to the first day, what exactly is an emergency? But the standard case of coercion, um, I would try to remember, uh, does not amount to an article 31 in this situation. Finally, escalation. Of course, that's a risk. That is always a risk. That is inherent in international law. That's part of the whole idea of, of, of countermeasures because there is possibly a disagreement between the two countries. Yeah? The coercer doesn't think it is coercive. It in fact thinks that it is asking for something completely legitimate. The Lithuanian example is even a good one because uh, the Chinese government is of the view that it's an interference in internal Chinese affairs to um, if China has addresses uh, the name of representations of a part of its territory. Now, that's for them an internal um, affair. Uh, it's also for them an internal affair if uh, they mistreat uh, people in Xinjiang, because for them, human rights, international obligations don't exist. Yeah? But that is not international law as seen everywhere else in the world. And that's why for everyone else, this is not an internal Chinese affair. And therefore, it is not an illegal act uh, to impose sanctions for those human rights violations. And therefore, those sanctions are not coerced. Yeah, but you can have these divergences of opinion. And then, of course, from the other perspective, the countermeasure against the coercion, which served as anti coercion against the human rights sanction, uh, would be uh, permitted. And there is, therefore, indeed a risk of escalation always inherent in those situations. Empirically, however, we do not see escalation that never ends. Remember the China US uh, trade uh, war. Um, also, um, section 232. Yeah, this was more buff buff, and then litigation, negotiation, and not a never ending vicious cycle of um, escalation. And finally, of course, countermeasures are not the solution, they are a means to arrive at a solution. Um, but they will not achieve that overnight. Can I? I'd, I'd like to come back. Uh on their relationship between general public international law and WTO law. And, and I'd like to use an example. Um, uh, a country threatens to um, hack uh, the uh, infrastructure in electricity, the digital system, etc., if things are not being done in a certain way. And, uh, how would you qualify such a, a threat in terms of international law? Would that be something which falls under general public international law as a threat to use a force, a modern force, modern form of force? Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you shoot at, the, at an electric power station or whether actually you, de you derail it by other means here. Um, and, and could it also be uh, affecting uh, WTO law uh, obligations and does the rule of lex specialis somehow come into play? I wonder whether you what, what are your views on that? It's a very difficult question and I, can't, I don't really have an answer but probably the hacking of the infrastructures by um, electronic uh, tools could be a violation of general international law and maybe in certain cases it could also be a violation of WTO law. But um, what I um, the question the question I have is how to respond to that kind of potentially um, international law inconsistent uh, conduct and if if this hacking is a violation of general international international law a response to that measure may be just justified as countermeasures against yes. the violation but if the measure, if, if the response measure is a trade measure, and then that measure is a violation of the WTO law, although it may be justified as countermeasures under general international law. So the response measure has like two natures to me. One is countermeasures under general international law, and then the other is WTO law violation. So- And, and the, if it's a WTO violation, uh then we, we're not allowed to take countermeasure before going through the dispute resolution mechanism well, today, which means uh, we basically can't react uh, 
for the time being. Well, the, 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 the conduct, the hacking is a violation of international law. So it, the um, countries can respond to the, the, the conduct without re having recourse to WTO DS. It's not a matter of WTO, it's not a matter of DSU Article 23. However, so there's no violation of Article 23. However, it could be a violation of other WTO law obligations, such as, I don't know, yeah, Article 11 or Article 3. Yeah. Article 3. But but if I, okay, let's say we take the hacker uh, attack, and then my reaction is I stop uh, exportation of electricity and I violate commitments which I made. Mm -hmm. So uh, am I allowed to do this or not? So, so under, uh, under, under general international law, I think it's- I am, yeah. yeah. But it, I have a gap commitment because yeah. uh, we, we have a, we basically have a prohibition of quantitative restrictions and we have even the, zero tariffs uh, often on, on, on electricity. So if I stop the exploitation of electricity. So to me, so there are two, two you know, two um, assessments. One, as I said, it's, it's justified under general international yes. law, but it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that it's not a violation of WTO law either. It, I'm not saying you can't take countermeasures against the hacking or other coercive conduct. However, the response measure still has inconsistency, in my view, with WTO law. And so the, uh, I mean, if I take the measure then, because if I don't take the measure, it's it doesn't have any effect and I can't really, uh, I would just basically run the risk of a WTO violation and then it would be up to the other party then to make a complaint to you. Is that, is that a scenario? Because, and uh, of course, uh, politically, that's very difficult to make a complaint if you harass somebody and then mm. come and say, you well, you can't reaction this to be. It's a, yep. is that part of the political economy here? It's, but it can be the only way of getting into the WTO because if you have mm. a hacking incident, and you want to sue the other country before an international tribunal, you have to find another international tribunal than those of the WTO, uh, because the hacking is presumably not a WTO breach. Um, and for that adjudication, you will need the agreement of the hacking uh, state, which yeah. might be denied. So then you take the countermeasure, and then the initiative for the litigation is shifted. Why would you need uh, why would you need another forum? Because uh, basically uh, there's a violation. Uh, you have to you feel this is a, this is a violation violation of, it, of international law, aggression, yeah. etc. So I'm entitled under public international law to react to that immediately no. if I want. I don't have to call upon a court to do so here. But you can you can if you want to settle the disagreement. Um, Otherwise, and in a binding manner, then the tribunal is your yeah, option. Yeah. On the breach of hacking, I mean, that's not really our subject and expertise, but uh, you, know, you know, there is the so called Tallinn Manual Number One, which is about cyber operations that qualify as use of force or threat, and Tallinn Manual Number Two, which is cyber operations that are internationally illegal but don't reach the threshold of uh, force or threat. And those indeed, but there can be other breaches, are often interventions. But that is then um, another form of intervention, but it can also be economic, of course, if it is a threat. Um, but um, you know, it's a bit different from our trade restriction, because in those cases, we wouldn't even ask the question, is this at the same time a double breach? I think that uh, we all want yes, to Yes, we're Sorry. discussing on the relationship between Public international law and yeah, WTO yeah, law yeah. on these, uh, and um, we we can uh, we we already opened up and come in. If you like to come in right now, please yeah. do. But you need to speak into this uh, ashtray. But <laughs> two small things. Uh, I'm not sure that hacking is not a WTO violation. There may be some intellectual property sort of violation. 
And uh, I agree that uh, the use of force, for instance, entitles you to a countermeasure. But I would also say that depending on your conception of how broad you read 21 and 20, all these countermeasures can also be justified under WTO. And then it's quite important your 28 public moral. Depending, the broader you open 28, you could almost include the entire the international law. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there was a separate session on this. I mean, this is being debated, um, and it's a valid debate uh, to be had. But the more conservative view is uh, that this is not Article 28, and especially countermeasures which um, address, which, which restrict trade in products. That are totally unrelated. Or 21, security. You that defend we, yourself. That we, we addressed before you answer the question whether the situation is. Is really security. So, but so hacking is. Special. But can I also say two other things that are really important? Very simple. One is let's not forget about the retortion, not just because of countermeasures, but there's also the concept of retortion, uh, which is something you're always permitted to do. And so if that is the chosen. Action or our instrument that is an option, uh, then all these problems we're discussing here uh, don't uh, arise. That's and right. then uh, for all of you who will, I'm sure, uh, quite a few of you will go away from the session with this nagging question this is really so that I can rely on a government to depart from an FDA or the obligation? Um, I want to give you, as a, to, along with that, a reflection, ongoing reflection. And um, that, of course, we know there are international obligations that are countermeasure proof. Yeah, I use this term, it's not well used, but you, you know what I mean. Um, and which are those human rights obligations, anything that is used for against, um, diplomatic immunities, at least diplomatic immunities. Yeah? But in no textbook of international law or it, State responsibility, will you find any reference that the WTO agreement contains obligations that are um, of that level and quality, human rights, use for games, and therefore not subject to uh, countermeasures? Yeah. Okay, we, we can. Uh, I'd like to move on to. Um, uh, Another question, and going through a case where we really uh, use uh, the WTO uh, mechanism. Uh, and this is a, a case on SPS measures. So uh, a government has a political uh, goal, for example, to influence the attitudes in the farming community, and then they stop the importation on apples, claiming that these apples are not safe under SPS. And the measure is being imposed. <clears throat> now you you have to challenge this through a WTO dispute settlement. Uh, you have to provide all the evidence. It takes a lot of time, uh, and you you may not help uh, your farmers in a reasonable period of time. So my question is uh, is is the instruments we have in the WTO to address these kind of measures are they are they appropriate? The traditional unilateral dispute resolution mechanism, which leaves all the rest aside, or could we contemplate collective action? Because uh, these measures, so obviously like Lithuania, uh, are are uh, irritant, isn't it? Everybody was irritated by this here. Isn't there a way that the international community could react more powerfully? Uh, to counter these kind of uh, measures and therefore also frustrate the taking of these measures because if you take them, you pay, you pay, pay actually quite uh, a high price in terms of reputation. You damage your own reputation and your own credibility in international relations here. But we haven't seen, uh, we haven't seen these reactions. Mm -hmm. Lithuania happily is a member of the EU, so the other 20 uh, want juice in, uh, but uh, if, if it's a single country like Australia, they're just left on their own and everybody else is just watching what's going on here. So um, I was wondering whether whether we can be more creative here, and I know that you, people say this is from real politique is, is probably not possible, but I think it's still worthwhile thinking through 
what we what we could do here in such situations which are fairly clear and obvious here. Who would like to address these questions? Uh, I think it depends on what kind of collective action needs to be taken. Uh, but generally speaking, I, if I may go back to my metaphor of painkiller and yoga, um, the uh, sort of um, forceful um, uh, strong action, strong response against like, the SBS measures you mentioned could be effective, rapid and effective. And as you said, WDS takes longer, but that sort of strong reaction has a lot of side effects. And actually, I'm from Japan, and Japan had had a had experience with China in 2010, and uh, China uh, banned uh, the imports of certain rare earth, and we, uh, together with the EU and the US, used used the WTO's settlement, and we got um, violation findings, and then the China uh, lifted the the, the um, export ban, and then we had a uh, we had. And then after the WTS case, we um, reduced the um, dependence on China for the imports of rare earth. So it took a long time, but we resolved the, the, the problem through this kind of a multilateral rules-based uh, reaction. So, um, and, and, and in the pre previous session, we talked about uh, not fully this not fully functioning dispute settlement. But I think I have I want to say that the W2DS is actually functioning to some extent. And we can still use this very good system. And so um, to to me uh, probably maybe it's, it's nice to be creative, it's nice to think about other options, but we should uh, no. pursue uh, yeah. more multilateral reaction. Yeah. It's not it's not necessarily instead of, you know. Right. It's a, yeah. I was just thinking in terms of a uh, type of uh, UN General Assembly resolution that, for example, uh, in, in, in the General Council, we could adopt a resolution where a uh, majority or even by consensus minus one, uh, the membership uh, requests a country to withdraw these measures. And um, we don't use these tools at all in the WTO. I can understand that uh, people don't want to be uh, uh, affected with the same type of measures and have the same damage, so they like to stay out. But um, there may be maybe softer measures which uh, have a preventive effect. That's my question. So we have two people. Yeah, please. Uh, you need to. Who was first, to me or? Uh, Actually, reflecting on your proposal, Thomas, recently during G7 meeting in Japan, they made a declaration on a statement that they will create a special coordination pl platform on economic coercion. And in particular, and here I would like to quote what, are the, what they want to achieve with this platform. They want to um, establish a warning and rapid information sharing. They want to regularly consult each other, collaboratively assess situations, explore coordinated responses, deter, and where appropriate counter economic coercion in accordance with our respective legal systems. So that was G7 meeting in Japan where they made officially in their statement, they said that they will cooperate, at least G7 countries. Will that be happening in the WTO or is that outside? It will be G7, but it will be like, it will be called coordination platform on economic coercion. So probably they will send some representatives to, to work together. I think that uh, in, in the uh, in the whole text that they are making reference to uh, you know like-minded states, which is really interesting because this one has before they don't make a specific reference to WTO. In the previous one they do. And uh, there was also a joint declaration against trade related economic pollution and non-market policies and practices signed by Australia, Canada. Japan, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and United States, right? Uh, in June last month as well. Again, one plus kind of a solution. But some of you you asked about the WTO, and of course the WTO is yeah. uh, relevant. Uh, but uh, what about the microphone? <laughs> this is the microphone. This is my yes, but he is speaking. Yeah, okay. No, no, he does not need. No, no, he doesn't need. He does not need. Okay. He, 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 he speaks, he needs it. Otherwise. Ah. 
facts on it. I'll give it back to you, right? <laughs> Just uh, don't worry. <laughs> The WTO is, of course, a relevant forum, and you, uh, Thomas, you are asking about WTO uh, bodies, committees, and so on. Um, yeah, there is certainly a potential there, and, and it's being used. Uh, Council for Trade and Goods has every uh, meeting, uh, several uh, coercive measures on its agenda, um, and uh, the coercive aspect is raised by some um, in those committees. The direct uh, victim sometimes does, sometimes prefer to uh, confine the statements and criticism to the WTO problem, the yeah. uh, SPS uh, illegality or the anti-dumping illegality. Um, and as you know, a committee yeah, can hear many statements um, and then that's it until the next uh, meeting. Dispute settlement is an option and so far, um, WTO action is the only action that has been employed. Canada brought the canola case, Australia wine and barley, anti-dumping cases. The EU brought the case against China for the Lithuania uh, restrictions. Um, so that, that is always an option. When disputes are ongoing, then they move out of the committees. Traditionally, Australia has now a settlement uh, over barley, which is in implementation. Um, part of such a settlement is often that the course of measures is withdrawn, and then we are speaking about three years down the line, um, before a panel ruling comes out, uh, and then no panel ruling comes out. So that means the reputational yeah. cost is then uh, avoided, and uh, that could also play, play a role. Yes, yeah. Okay, Maria? It was just to see whether I understood all the important contributions yeah. that have been uh, uh, proposed to us because uh, uh, I do think that in the anti coercion instrument there is uh, an answer to the suggestion of Professor Cotier beyond the very important initiative that was recalled by Irina. Uh, because it says that before acting, before adopting a countermeasure, the European Union will have to, um, uh, to gather. Uh, together the countries that are potentially interested in joining the European Union in facing the situation um, that is uh, qualified as economic coercion. So there is uh, this uh, uh, multilateral or plurilateral uh, diplomatic initiative. But then if I understand correctly the uh, reconstruction of the legal framework by Lothar. Uh, basically, uh, you are saying, correct me whether I misunderstand you, that in case there is an infringement of the principle of non-interference in internal or external affairs, uh, even if uh, a measure adopted by a WTO member has a trade effects, these uh, um, trade effects should not be considered as a falling within the WTO system. Are you saying this? No. Okay. So in the, in the disputes, I just mentioned to uh, otherwise it has been uh, okay. correctly that WTO litigation is an option that's even mentioned in the uh, draft anti coercion instrument. Now, the question is is that an effective option if you litigate during the litigation, the measure stays there? And what you said earlier, Thomas, I think you were also alluding to a faster remedy. And, and, and then we have the duration of WTO dispute settlement, the absence of interim measures, the absence of damages for a past harm and injury, uh, all things that exist on the general uh, international law, and that reduce significantly the price for the wrongdoer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And but I don't think we need to discuss here the challenges that would be involved in trying to make WCD Switzerland so fast and to add interim measures that the country, the coercion country, as to suspend measures during the litigation, that would be really good. In the WTO, traditionally, we always say, no, 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 we can't do that. If we have a measure to protect the environment or health, we cannot suspend it until we hear whether that is permitted on a WTO agreement. But for a coercive measure, that is perhaps far more feasible. And on the international law, um, the countermeasures have to be suspended during litigation, but only if the challenge measure is also suspended. I think the, uh, the idea of interim measure is something uh, which is really interesting to, to 
reflect, you know, it doesn't really prejudge because you could link it up with uh, damages in case uh, the measure is not uh, correct. Uh, so, the, but these are just things one could one can contemplate also for, for other cases too. Okay, so um, we'll have a, we'll have a eight more eight more minutes. So let's let's take uh, <coughs> questions and then you have your final word. Countries uh, see their obligations both under the WTO agreement and under other international agreements that are here. And I'm wondering if that agreement uh, is um, about to cast uh, the supply and answer, but perhaps, uh, perhaps we need to think about Perhaps we are already thinking about that in terms of the global welfare, I said. Because um, the response in most of these situations has just been a WTO response. Uh, and so they're going sort of the, the least, um, or, or, or sort of the narrowest way possible in order to uh, maintain some sense of coherence uh, and international law, not prejudging that person. That was, um, I mean, that was the require that the WHO time is actually allowed to uh, look into international generally independently from WTO law. Uh, if, if, you know, if we use the, the use of force uh, public international law avenue that we would link this up. Questions? Yes. Yes, uh, Patrick Abel, uh, University of Passau. I have a question uh, that relates to the to the bigger picture, let's say, because uh, Ting Chen has also mentioned other responses um, to coercive measures, such as, um, for example, building up or strengthening the general resilience um, of a country, of an economy. And I think the EU has um, introduced lots of instruments in the last months and years that are precisely oriented towards that building up, uh, for example, obligatory supplies, um, for example, solidarity mechanisms in, in, in situations of economic emergencies. And I'm, I would like to ask, um, well, Lothar, actually, if, it's, um, if that is something that is thought together and how it influences, especially the proportionality analysis of potential countermeasures. And I'm wondering if it, resilience building is so strong and at some point that the room for countermeasures is reduced because there are other means available to react. I'll put it here. Rick, did you want to ask? Say something? No, this was not your yeah. Who wants to? The question was to you. So. Yeah, but not only. Uh, there were several remarks. Uh, so, but I, I can kick this off, and then yeah. anyone yeah. please jump in anytime. So, uh, yes, of course, there are many other things that can be done: mitigation, um, uh, alternative uh, destinations for the exports that are uh, blocked. Um, I have here focused more narrowly on the legal questions and the international law and WTO law legal question that is fascinating enough. But of course, this 
field is much, much broader, has been well studied by the way everything the Australians did, um, the Canadians also, for Canola, uh, but the Australians were under severe pressure. This was a big, it was 5% of all, uh, all Australian exports. Um, and um, so that's well researched, well documented in the area by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and the um, Center for Strategic uh, Initiatives, CSIS in Washington. Uh, CSIS in Washington also has held two events. Uh, the, one was the launch of a report on, on coercion at which uh, the State Department uh, spoke and presented in an impressive manner all the things which the United States did to help the Lithuanian um, economy, with the result that the economy, uh, Australian uh, Lithuanian exports, um, rather than falling as a result of all these measures, increased by uh, 39 percent, maybe also due to the other factors. Uh, but so uh, a lot can be done. Um, compensating the victims is also an option for us. That is an option um, in this instrument only if uh, we obtain reparations, uh, which is also a consequence of the breach of international law. Um, that doesn't exist at all in the WTO, and I know that also as well in international law, that is not always realistic, but it does uh, exist, and not only in investment uh, law. Um, so that is, um, of course, a much more complex uh, picture. Definition of uh, coercion, no. So if you look at Article 2 of the proposal, and you look at Article 2 of the uh, finally adopted uh, regulation in the fall, uh, you will see that this uh, aims to match exactly uh, coercion on the international law. There is, of course, also the requirement of a measure restricting or affecting trade or investment. That is for us to not capture any coercion, but only economic coercion. That was also a reason of competence uh, for us. Um, but the demand having to be uh, relating to an area falling under the sovereignty of the target, you will find that language there very um, expressly. Very good. Uh, can, okay. I, can I just uh, also refer to the US uh, law because that has not been spoken much about. Um, US legislation, which is a bill, is fascinating uh, for one reason, namely that it does not apply to cases where the United States is concerned, of course. It applies only to cases where someone else is being coerced. And for such situations, the bill Inter alia provides for the possibility of punitive duties against the person and preferential duty reductions for the victim of uh, coercion. So I ask all of you uh, how that is going to be justified under the WTO agreement. It's a completely different story than what I told you because countermeasure is only for the victim. We have collected countermeasures, but only in the event of agonomous breaches. The use of force is an agonomous breach. Human rights violations in Oregon speech, but interference in the internal affairs of another state is not an Oregon yeah, yeah. uh, breach. And perhaps a final small remark, because the term coercion is, of course, per se much, much broader than what we discussed here today in relation to non intervention. And coercion per se, even in law, covers everything where force is being used. Now, if a criminal is arrested by the police, that is coercion. But that's, of course, not what we're speaking about. And the term is also misused sometimes to say um, that was a direct reaction to the G7 uh, statement, by the way, the day after um, the Russian government, the Chinese government, but also academics um, uh, with everywhere in the world said, oh, but the G7 or the US government, the EU are the biggest courses in the world because look, they impose sanctions uh, now against Russia. Uh, tons of sanctions, which is coercive. Um, and so it always brings us back to the definition of what exactly are we speaking about? Uh, is it the intervention? And of course, a sanction, which is also a countermeasure uh, in response to the use of force, um, is of course not um, interference in internal affairs because the use of force is not an internal affair. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're, we're uh, done. And I just like to. Uh, offer the possibility to have a final remark, the three ladies. Yeah, um, if I can just say something that would be also response yes, to uh, the question. I think that the what we discuss here about the European Union approach is really that uh, you know this regulation maybe just 
one pill, but there is a treatment that is much broader to actually build the resilience of the system through a number of other regulations. Some are new, some are reformed, like the you know, a trade enforcement, um, FDI screening, uh, foreign subsidy, like you know, 90% of uh, investments that are coming from China have some sort of subsidy. So better screening as well, more support for you know, uh, domestic industries. That could be debatable to what extent that itself can be you know, um, against WTO rules. But anyways, there is a whole system that's been put in place uh, within the EU. And I think that people should really think whether anyone else can go that route. But, but that's the root of actually um, minimizing that asymmetric interdependence, right? Building the resilience within the system, trying to uh, make it stronger, uh, better monitoring, uh, more transparency, and so on and so forth, changing the blocking statutes so that, you know, maybe individual companies can actually get some um, concrete remedies as well, because that one was really uh, capturing all particular, you know, extraterritorial, uh, you know, uh, sanctions of the United States, reach of U.S. Uh, law. So, whether other countries could do that, I'm not quite sure. I think that the European Union is doing the stuff that maybe developed economies can do, but for small countries, I really doubt that they can just rise to the occasion. <laughs> Jim, would you like to have a closing word? I think I thank everyone for your a lot of questions for me. I'll bring them back then to improve my study. Very good. So you got some feedback. Okay. Well, very, very, very briefly, um, this raises a very interesting question of the uh, relationship between WTO law and international general international law, or where WTO law sits in, in general international law. And as someone suggested, uh, the principle of uh, systemic integration requires WTO law to be uh, interpreted harmoniously with other areas of international law. However, at the same time, I think international law is then inherently fragmented. So we can't have hierarchical, integrated, systemic uh, law, like domestic law in international law. So, um, well, this uh, is a very fascinating uh, question and I, I think I'm gonna keep studying yeah. on the subject. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, um, thank the panelists for their contribution, the comments, and also your remarks and contributions uh, in this interesting uh, topic. And I'd like to close uh, the session. Thank you very much.